Standing up in McKinney, this is According to Callus, episode 532. Time for another No Shame November. It's Friday and we've got a No Shame November. This would be number two. I, I guess technically No More Military from yesterday might not be far off from the No Shame November, but I'm trying to fo- follow a form here, right? So last week we missed because I was down hanging out with the uh, Texacon folks. I g- gave you a couple of episodes this week that had to do with that. And returning back to form, since I missed last Friday, this Friday we're going to do No Shame November. But before I get into the main topic, let me remind you the best way you can help me, the best way you can continue to make a difference, the best way that we can push back against the machine, if you will, is for you to like, share, and subscribe to this program. Follow me on the social media. Join the group or the page over on Facebook. Uh, find me on Gab or MeWe. And if you're feeling or feeling particularly froggy, go on over to YouTube and see if my show is still up. Hey, I've got an email. It's not hard to find me. At a, well, according to Callus at, at att.net and a cell phone number, which again, not easy to find. <laughs> no, it's everywhere. Check it out. I'd love to hear from you via text or uh, email. Uh, would love to start getting some uh, listener generated shows in spirit of Brian McClanahan. But for today, let's talk about, I've got three topics that I want to touch base on. Uh, directly related to the no shame, and then a little story related to things going on in my own backyard. So here we go. Issue number one, right? The the first item of no shame November on episode two is, yes, once again, the city of McKinney is looking for another way to get we the people to pay for an airport. Now, you may recall we've had two bonds fail on this very issue. Yet, that has not stopped some of the city leadership from pressing forward. Now, I got to tell you, there's there's twofold issue here. One, there's the people that just don't want an airport, period, end of story. And when I say they don't want an airport, they don't want passenger service and an expanded airport. They accept the fact that there was an airport there. They accept the fact that some... There are some uh, private flights, little Cessnas, and occasionally cargo that's going in and out of there. I, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt that the vast majority of the people knew what that was when they moved here, and they're kind of okay with it. They don't want to expand it. They have zero interest in expanding, and that's just the people in McKinney. Then when we look at the fact that there's people in Fairview, to a lesser extent, Allen, certainly the folks over on Bridge Farmer Road that are in Lowry Crossing or New Hope, and perhaps as far north as Anna or Melissa, they have zero desire to have a full-fledged airport in East McKinney. They're opposed to it. Now, whether I agree with them or not, they have every right to be opposed to it. And you would think if in a, we were living in truly a representative republic, right? The idea that our elected officials were told no not once but twice would be sufficient enough to convince them that there was no good way forward here. Well, one could speculate that some of the wealthy landowners over there who are actually uh, significantly successful businessmen in their own right, they want it. They, They made an investment over there and they're expecting a payout. They're wanting their quid pro quo, if you will. And of course, this is just speculation. We don't know this for a fact. But so there, those are the two sides of the dichotomy. Then there are people like me. We're not really for the airport or against the airport, but we don't feel like and we don't think it is a good idea for we the people, for the taxpayers of the city of McKinney to foot the bill for the airport expansion, only to then turn it over to a private organization who is going to reap the rewards. No, if a private organization wants to come in and run the airport or take over the airport, they ought to have to invest their own money. This is just the standard procedure where they privatize profits and publicize the losses. Make we the people eat the loss when it doesn't work and then keep the money for themselves when it does work out. Now, 
I have no direct animosity to the people that actually want to build an airport. There is a viable, or I should say build out the airport. There is a viable, legitimate argument as to why an expanded airport in its operations would be beneficial. But it wouldn't be beneficial just to the city of McKinney. No, it would be beneficial to the entirety of Collin County. I mean, that's the story. It's a good argument. Now, whether you believe it or not, again, not relevant. Do you think that we, the people of McKinney, ought to foot the bill for it? That's where the problem is. If it was truly viable and it was a good investment, then those private entities would buy in and they would build it themselves. They wouldn't want to stuff it on us, we the people. But they know, based upon all the special sweetheart deals that have been made over the last couple of decades when we're building out Collin County, that if you ask for it, the city will give it to you. They have a vested interest in bringing companies and businesses into their town and they'll give you tax credits, tax breaks, incentive programs. They'll make it worth your while. So you must ask for it. But this is a situation where they've done more than ask for it. They've asked us to pay for it on the hopes that we might recoup it, recoup that investment on the back end. Now, look, I don't know much about airport operations. I don't know much about the engineering of an airport. I don't claim to know any any of those things. So what I have to say here, yeah, you have a right to be dubious. But you should also be dubious when somebody that's a government official tells you, oh, it's not going to cost you that much. Or don't worry, we're going to get our money back. Because I'll tell you, there is prima facie evidence that that is extremely rare if that ever happens. And more likely than not, they're going to come back with their hands out again. We have been paying money into this airport since I moved to McKinney, Texas, nearly 27 years ago, and I have yet to see a net positive outcome. They tell us that they're subsidizing it less. They tell us that it's, you know, starting to quote pay for itself. That's fine. And that's great. But why am I spending more money on this? Why am I being forced to eat it? Now, I could make an argument that, hey, the county is going to benefit. So maybe some of the other county or some of the other cities in the county or perhaps even the county ought to pitch in on this. Now, I'm fairly certain that would never fly. I'm fairly certain the people that are in, oh, I don't know, New Hope, Fairview, the folks over there in uh, off of Bridge Farmers, I, I, I named just Lowry Crossing, excuse me, Lowry Crossing, Uh, Anna, Melissa, Alan, they don't want this. Now, the folks over in Frisco, they might think it's a great idea. I mean, Lord knows there's plenty of good corporate people out there that would like to not have to go down to DFW when they could go to McKinney. But let me ask you, they have private airport access in there in Addison as well. So why are they so hot to trot to come out to McKinney? What's the net benefit in being in McKinney? Is it really that much faster or easier to get to? I don't know. I think it's a good question. I certainly would like to have those answers. I want to know who's going to win. I don't believe it's we the people. I I don't believe it's the city of McKinney as far as their citizens. Perhaps the city will get a little something something on the side. Certainly, I would imagine that it's quite likely that some of the city leadership is going to get more than a little something something on the side. I mean, why else would they be so vested in this happening? I mean, you could say maybe they're true visionaries and they they can see the future and they know what's going to happen and they want to be deep-seated, invested in this. Okay, maybe. Then make that sales pitch. I'd like to hear it. I'd like for, I don't know, someone in the city government to come out and give their best pitch why they think this is a good idea and why after being rejected via a bond twice that they're just going to ignore it and move forward. I would like to see that sales pitch. I don't know, maybe Mr. Mayor is going to roll out and do it and tell us why we're all a bunch of morons and we don't understand anything, but but how fortunate we are that we have his royal highness there to guide us through this difficult time and take all of our money and invest it in something that will never, ever pay us back. I mean, that would be my speculative question. Now, perhaps it's not fair to name call or whatever else, but when somebody disregards the will of the people, would it not be fair to say they're acting like a king? They're they're acting like they're the regent? Hmm? Of course, it just could be me. 
All right. Item number two. This is a little easier. Our friends, the feds. And, and I, I just want to, before I move on to item number two, you have to have no shame to be willing to ignore the electorate, not once, but twice. You have to have no shame to say, tough luck, we're going to do this anyway. That's how that fits, by the way. Item number two, the federal abuse. Now, I don't know how many of you have been following along, but more and more information is coming out regarding the January 6th situation, right? The so-called fed, I mean, fed surrection, right? The, this, the so-called attempted overthrow by the feds. I mean, look, I wasn't there. Maybe you were, maybe you thought about it. Maybe you supported it from afar. Me, I just, I saw giant red flags and I, I smell the rat. I'm glad I didn't go. I, I wish I could say that I fully understood what was going to happen. I wish I could say that I had the foresight to know that it was essentially a trap. I didn't. I just, something didn't feel right. And certainly didn't want to invest the time and money to go to DC to protest something that I wasn't going to lose sleep over with. Anyway, yeah, they stole the election. Yeah, they got rid of Trump. But let me tell you, I'm worried about far more important things and worse things than that, especially things in my own, <laughs> my own city. That being said, it more and more evidence is coming out, more and more abuse is coming out, and they're still hunting down people that trespassed three years ago, yet they've done nothing with all the people that were burning down cities, all the people that were rioting in cities. They, they've done nothing to deal with that issue. They, they ignored the entirety of the border situation. Hey, but you right-wing extremists that were Trumpers, you showed up on January 6th and you took a guided tour of the state cal- or the federal capital. Clearly, you're the giant threat to society and everything must cease until we collect you all and abuse you all and solitary confinement you all and, quite frankly, treat you as bad or worse than the people that took out the World Trade Center. Now, my dear listeners, some of you are probably wondering, where are you going to go with this, Callus? We, we, you've talked about this more than one occasion. It's true, I have. I had a conversation over this last weekend with an individual on the other side of the aisle of me. And one of the things that he remarked on, and again, this is not anything that I haven't heard before, but it was interesting hearing it from somebody that doesn't see it the same way I do. He said that he's had an opportunity to talk with some of the January 6th protesters. And he said he's heard from almost all of them that the people that are actually violating laws, that were creating vandalism and were doing the bad things, they were feds. And I'm like, okay, well, I've heard that too. I, uh, he said, oh, but it gets more interesting. See, I've talked to some of those BLM activists, some of the so-called Antifa activists, and they said that a good number of their people that were doing those bad things were in fact feds or suspected feds as well. Well, now it gets interesting because I, I really hadn't heard this before. I mean, I had my suspicions because think about it. Who gains? Why is it suddenly that we're building a new, bigger building for the FBI? The same FBI that has been proven to be corrupt. The same FBI that took out a sitting president, the same FBI that is abusing people's rights all over this country. Why in the world are we rewarding them? Could it be that they're actually doing the job that they were given? Could it be that the Uniparty actually has got a vested interest in keeping us fighting amongst ourselves and not paying attention to them? A friend of mine sent me a cartoon. It's got two monkeys fighting in the middle. One monkey is uh, labeled MAGA Republicans or just MAGA, if you will. And the other one's labeled the rest of Republicans. And all the people standing around in the cartoon watching this and cheering are labeled Democrats. Now think about that. They've got the Republican Party successfully fighting amongst themselves instead of focusing on the enemy. They've got, let's call them Democrats, even the moderates fighting with the conservatives over 
smaller items. Meanwhile, they're abusing us all. Meanwhile, they're setting us all up for a fail. Meanwhile, they're tricking us into thinking that the other people are the enemy as opposed to who the enemy really is. So at what point are we going to wake up? At what point are we going to figure out that even though I don't agree with this guy, he's not my enemy. Now, here's where it gets kind of dicey. There's an overwhelming urge of me to call out for the purge of the FBI. We want them all gone. We want the whole thing just scrapped, cast asunder, and the building demoed and salted. There, there's an there's an urge there. But then that little small voice in the back of my head says, but Stephen, you do actually need an FBI. Certainly not the abusive, power-hungry machine that's in front of you now, but somebody that can help coordinate with the local states and the or the locals and the states, somebody that can help oversee and provide intelligence. You you can make an argument there, Stephen. Why would you want to get rid of all of it? And, and I got to say, yeah, it's a compelling argument, but then we're going to just be where we are right now, 50 or 75 years from now, right? Doing the same thing over again, dealing with would-be tyrants and, and abusers of power. So if we strip it all away and leave them with maybe two things to do and maybe a couple of dozen people at most to do it, I mean, it's going to take them a whole lot longer to rebuild after that to turn into the monstrosity that we face right now. And these are just the FBI. That's not even talking about all the other alphabet soup agency people, right? DEA, ATF, or I guess technically it's B-A-T-F-E, you know, the F troop. Uh, I'm certain that there's plenty of good men and women in these bureaus or in these agencies that are actually thinking they're doing good work. They're actually saving us and keeping us protected from the bad guys out there, but they just fail to realize, or perhaps they willfully don't acknowledge that they're being led by bad people. They're being directed to do bad things. They're being directed to work against the very people that depended on them to protect them. The question is, what do you do? Well, clearly the leadership has no shame, right? This is where it ties in folks. And clearly the vast majority of the people that are quote unquote, the boots on the ground, they're either clueless or have no shame. Or maybe, maybe they just are fearful. Well, what am I going to do? I've got 15 years in, in the agency and I want my retirement plan. Doggone it. I, I, I deserve this. I earned this. Maybe you did. But what's more important, doing the right thing, standing up for your country, keeping your oath, or getting that little bit of money when you retire? And let me ask you folks, here's something else to consider. These same federal agents that, let's just be generous, they have between 10 and 18 years, and they constantly have to turn a blind eye to all the bad stuff, all the corruption. Are they really actually doing their job anymore? I mean, how could they? They're complicit at the very least to what's going on, complacent by attitude. And quite frankly, are they really somebody you want to hang out with? Do you want to just pretend with them? Everything's okay. When clearly we can see it is not. And worse yet, these guys and these ladies, they're putting everything on a future that may not even happen. If you destroy the country that pays your bills, that's going to pay your pension, how do you expect to still have that pension? Where do you think you're going to go be able to retire? Do you really think the 1% is going to allow you in their special retreat area? I don't think so. Now, they're going to have a couple of their well-armed, you know, attack dogs there. Sure. But are you going to be that? I mean, look at the odds. I'd say they're pretty slim. So again, we know they have no shame. The question is, do you have any shame? Do you, if you're working at an alphabet soup agency, do you have enough shame to say, man, what I'm doing is wrong here. I can't ignore this. I got to do the right thing. I've got to uphold my oath. I've got to consider the fact that I might have children or grandchildren and I care about what happens in their future. I cannot and I should not continue to do what I'm doing. I should not turn a blind eye to the corruption, the bad things. 
I, I want to protect my country above all. I want to serve my God, assuming that they actually believe in God. Maybe they do. Maybe, maybe that's part of the problem. They have the wrong God, right? <laughs> going back to the idea that we're always going to serve somebody, right? So again, no shame. It's a curious thing how that plays out. All right, item number three. So the State Board of Education, who is supposed to be in charge of the curriculum and holding school boards uh, accountable and making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do in the state of Texas, apparently they're considering either ignoring or rewriting the rules that were spelled out in the legislature to not do pro-critical race theory things or critical theory things to not teach the inverse of socialism. I'm sorry. That's not right. That's not what I meant to say. To not teach that there is any advantage to socialism. To to not teach collective thought. Now, granted, as a high schooler's parent, well, I not anymore. My Both my kids are post-high school. But as, as a high schooler, when I was the parent, I would have been just fine with them understanding what these political theories are and with them seeing how they played out. But I suspect that's not how it's going to play. I'm really concerned that we have to re-litigate all these things all the time. We have the Texas legislature, which we can barely get them to do the few things that we demand they do. And then they set out orders and they write in their little loopholes so that all the school districts have to do is find that loophole or find a way to wiggle around it and do whatever the heck they want. And then we've got a state board of education, which is should be able to keep those under control and mandate that you must use certain curriculum and follow certain rules in order to fulfill the purpose of the school district that has now decided that they're going to start doing whatever in the world they want as well. So let me ask you, going back to the original question, do we live in a representative republic? Because if we live in a representative republic, these people ought to be doing the things that they were sent there to do. They ought to be respecting the will of the people that sent them there. Now, I understand some of those reps were put in with a 51 or 52 percent majority. So, yeah, maybe they're going to be a little squishy. I get it. Some of these things are complicated. It's not as directly clear. School vouchers, for example. But at the end of the day, if they don't know, they ought to default to what their last order or directive was from the people that actually hire them to go do their job. I mean, I know we can't get our state reps to have enough shame to go listen and act on the things we send them to do. So I guess at this point, we shouldn't be surprised that the State Board of Education chooses to do the same things. We know the governor, the lieutenant governor, they don't give a rip with what we think. Oh, until they want to show up at the next rally and ask for money. But until then and after then, they just completely dismiss what we the people want, need, and desire. How else do you explain the southern border being ignored for extended periods of time. Now, we should call it an invasion, but we're afraid to do that. Well, they're not coming with firearms. No, because the firearms are already here for them. They're not crooks. Well, no, except for the part where they broke into the country. Well, they're not up to bad things, except for the fact that most of them have lied, have come across with drug dealers or drug pushers or human traffickers, or quite frankly, are foreign nationals that are here to disrupt our country. But Again, we're not allowed to talk about that. Why? Because our leadership has no shame. They're afraid of upsetting these evil entities as opposed to supporting we the people, as opposed to doing the job we sent them there to do. So why would we be surprised when we see the same kind of stuff starting to come out of the State Board of Education? I mean, look, they watch the Texas House do whatever the heck they want. Now the Texas Senate is better marginally. They watch the governor basically waste everybody's time for the last 12 years to do not much of anything. Well, why should we? Why should we? we we've got our seats. They're never going to run and beat us. Who cares? Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what it boils down to. They don't care about us. They don't care about you. They care about their next election and their own pocketbook. And it's because they have no shame. You think I'm not being fair? Well, that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion, but just remember, you're listening to my show and it's called According to Callus for a reason because it's about what I think and what I believe. 
And you know what? Occasionally I'll get something wrong. And if somebody calls me out on it, I'll be the first to lay it out. Hey, I got this wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Or I was, I misunderstood this and I'm sorry. As of right now, really haven't heard that. Nope. Not once. All right. So we're about 25 minutes in. Let me take a few minutes to tell you a little story. Now, I've talked about this in passing and certainly a little more opaque in the past. I'm not going to give a lot of detail because, quite frankly, I got enough drama in my life. Political drama, just to be clear. So I spent some time with a group of people trying to figure out what the cause of a problem was and what are some probable solutions. Now, those of you that are aware of what I'm talking about, yes, I'm talking about that. Those of you that are not aware of it, I'm being purposely not specific because I'm trying to not make this about personalities or individuals. Over the course of our investigation, we listened to a number of people. They gave us their ideas, their thoughts, their probable solutions, some of them. Um, At the conclusion of that, the, the group of people talked about, well, what did we think? What were valuable insights? What did we agree upon? What do we think are uh, faults that we are, think are obvious or addressable? I mean, some things you can't fix or you can't address, right? But if it's something there that could be addressed, and then what do we think we can do to improve the situation? What are, what are some ideas that you've come up with? Now, I got to be honest, I'm all for rules when rules make sense. I'm all for rules when rules prevent somebody else from cheating or prevent you from cheating. I'm all for rules when they seek to facilitate getting work done or getting a deal done. Rules are supposed to be there to assist, not be a stumbling block, not be abused as to not allow for anything to get done or accomplished. So what does that mean? That means at the beginning of the discussion, if you say, this is the expectation, this is the direction we're going to go, and this is what we're hoping to get out of it. And oh, by the way, nothing's binding that we do here. It's just a list of ideas. You would think that sets up the tone that, okay, this is supposed to be freewheeling. This is supposed to give all the good ideas. This is supposed to give us an opportunity to Seek to improve the situation. But I got to tell you, when it turns into a contest of wills, when it turns into a, they must be done my way or you're wrong. And oh, by the way, we cheated the system to get the result that we wanted. And because we did that, now we're going to tell you you're wrong and you're not going to be able to do what you set out to do. Now, how is that helpful? How is that a net positive? How do we get a good outcome there? So from our part of this equation, every idea that was talked about should be included. Everything that was discussed over that period of time is valuable to some degree or another. Now, some things determined or necessitated, if you will, a little bit more detailed explanation. Other things are somewhat self-evident. And once you tell the organization or you tell another group of people, this is what we think you could do about it, it's their decision and their responsibility to figure out how to make that work. It's not ours to tell them exactly how to do that. Now, sadly, (laughs) sadly, that's not what happens. And disappointed at how these things play out is constantly detrimental to the overall goal and seems to be lost on the very people that are most upset about the fact that they can't win. It just is mind boggling to me. So it comes to a point where you got to ask yourself, since these people have no shame, what, what's the best way to handle it? Do you fight below the belt like they do? Do you cheat the system like they've done? Do you stoop 
to <laughs> doing whatever it takes to get the win? I don't know. That's an interesting question, though, isn't it? So my default answer to all this always is everything should be put in front of the large organization and let the large organization decide what they want to do, what they want to hear, what ideas are best, what actions, if any, they want to take. There's no reason to deprive them of any of the information. Unfortunately, unfortunately, cancel culture or Censorship is not only utilized on the left. It's shameful, but it happens every day, all the time. But the good news is, I'm me. I'm going to continue to be me. And I'm going to do what's right in my own mind at the face of anybody. There's literally maybe three people on the planet that can pull me aside and say, Stephen, I need you to listen to me. You can be right all day long, but you're going to cause this damage or that damage, and I need you to stop. I, I need you to just not do it anymore. That hasn't happened on these occasions. And what's worse yet is to know you're right, and the people that you're working with know you're basically right, but because they want their way, they won't acknowledge it. It's frustrating. It's disappointing. There there can be no discussion with people that can't have a rational argument. There can be no discussion with people that only want to hear one thing. There can be no discussion with people that have already made their mind up and dismiss anything and everything put before them. And in case you're wondering, yeah, I've been guilty of that on time time, I'm sure as well. This is not about I'm better than everybody else. This is not about those other people are terrible. It's just human nature. We have to do better. We have to have just a a wee bit of shame. We have to acknowledge our limitations. And we have to be willing to swallow our pride and work with other people to get things done. And that's the last thing I want to leave you with on this Friday. Kick it off. Enjoy the weekend. Next week is coming up Thanksgiving. One of the most important holidays of the year, in my opinion. And that wraps up No Shame, November, Friday, number two. And until next time, I will see you on the other side.